Hello, and welcome to LexisNexis Risk Solutions Facing Change series. I'm Mike Nathan, and today I'm joined by Gary Billingham, Senior Relationship Manager at CIFAS. Gary, welcome. Um, what is CIFAS's particular assessment of money mules? When did they first appear on your radar as an issue, and how has it evolved over recent years? So money mules, is, as, a, as a term, if you like, it's probably only really emerged um, as a big part of the radar for the last five, five to six years. And I think it's an evolution of um, a criminal uh, ultimately laundering money. I think um, it's also indicative of one of the key trends which we've seen in terms of uh, changes in fraud behaviour, whereby organised criminals and, and semi-organised fraudsters, if you like, have got better at distancing themselves from the actual act or from the fraud themselves. Um, so it's a, it's a big part of... Um, of the, of the risk register of the risk landscape for for our members and obviously uh, for ourselves um the key targets in terms of individuals which have been recruited for to be involved in mule activity um some of the some of the younger demographic were obviously um a key target i'd say um five or six years ago when that, the the issue was uh, was a was a was 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 of as large its prominence but it looks as though anybody's game when it comes to mule herders at the moment. And yeah, I think it is really interesting when you actually think about these these different categories you've described. I guess the unwitting mule and the uh, the people who've sold on their accounts as well, are more you know, knowingly actually participating in that fraud. Can you maybe just expand on that a little bit? Why is the mule essential? Why do we often talk about money mules when we talk about digital banking fraud? Um, mules play a big key part because it helps distance the the, the criminals and the fraudsters from the original offence by using third parties uh, and sometimes um, um, non-complicit or um, uh, unaware individuals that what they're actually being involved in, whilst it may be portrayed as a uh, as an act which or a service, is is ultimately laundering money or laundering the proceeds of crime. Um, are you starting to see that banks are beginning to join their AML and fraud departments, particularly around money mules? Because it's obviously a common issue to both areas. Yeah, there are some big success stories um, when we speak to some of our members in the, within the banking industry where they've, they've, they've used this as an opportunity for fraud and financial crime teams to work and collaborate really, really well together. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you can position... Uh, the stakeholders correctly as to who's involved in the wider strategy around money mules, then that's a, you're, you're, in a, you're in a good position if you can. But it's not strictly a financial crime problem. And it's not strictly a fraud problem. You do need both. What do you think um, the impact of COVID-19 and the lockdown has had on money mules in the UK? <sighs> Unfortunately, um, it's led to an increase in, in, in money mule. And it ultimately provides more opportunities for mule herders to um, provide opportunities for, um, for for money muling to look like legitimate activity. As a result of um, COVID, the opportunities for fraud have increased because um, people are either um, furloughed or they're unable to work or they've lost their job, which means that they are at home and they need, um, they need a source of income. So the opportunity increases. Unfortunately, the rationalisation or the justification for doing it also increases. Um, some people may feel as though that their business has been closed down unfairly and they should be able to work or they should be able to operate their business and they can't due to the lockdown measures which have been put in place. And unfortunately, sometimes people feel that um, they can justify an act or justify being involved in an activity greater if they feel as though they've been, they've, they're have been hard done by, which quite some people act absolutely are and then finally um the motivation absolutely increases if people have lost their job and lost income they do need more income and they may be presented with either a clearly presented opportunity to be involved in this uh, and take advantage of it or they may be less likely to pick up on the signs that actually this job offer which i've been presented with isn't a job offer it is processing payments which are illicitly uh, obtained um, and the social distancing element or the lack of contact with uh, with other family members, if they're contacted by individuals online, potentially portraying themselves as as interested partners in the form of romance scams, again, they, they may be more inclined to, to participate in activity which they wouldn't 
necessarily normally do. It's like this in life, isn't it? If it seems too good to be true, it often is. And people should be cautious about promises of money and employment, making serious money working from home, especially from an unsolicited text or email that would come through. Um, I know you've been involved in the Money Mules project with some of the consultation with the big banks um, with the aim of bringing potentially the financial ombudsman in line with this growing issue on how mules are recorded in the database. Could you tell me a little bit more about this? Um, the idea of the, the consultation with banks was to understand um, what best practice looked like uh, in terms of a, an effective money mule strategy. So we spoke to um, half a dozen banks specifically around what they did in respect of money mules. Um, not only did how they detect them, but also how did they prevent the activity, um, which was really useful because that helps to justify the, the burden of proof or the standard of proof as to when um, uh, an incident of uh, money mule conduct should be reported to the National Fraud Database. So that was a large part of what we did. Um, as a consequence of that, we also um, changed our case structure. Um, so we uh, we added more uh, detail to our case structure, which told uh, a clearer picture of what uh, what conduct an individual had been involved in and what steps the bank had made to try and investigate that conduct before reporting it to the database. Yeah, it makes me think a little bit about the kind of the punishment. We know that this could lead for an individual to a potentially a, cr- a criminal conviction for being a complicit money mule. Do you think... Um, criminal proceedings and that type of punishment is enough of a deterrent. The difficulty from a law enforcement point of view when it comes to um, criminal criminal action is the layers and the chains in which transactions go through. So in an, it, it, it would be far easier if you had one herder or one person of criminal organised criminal intent who then uses one mule to participate or to launder the funds that they had. In that scenario, it may be realistic and achievable for law enforcement or for an enforcement uh, solution to this problem. Um, Unfortunately, that's just not the case. Quite often when we speak to members and when you understand the chain of events which involves, there are multiple mules and multiple herders. And that money trail makes it very, very difficult to effectively arrest arrest your way out of a problem. Um, The biggest issue or the biggest complex issue with 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 money mule is is an educational point of view the messages in terms of prevent prevention and educating individuals about the risks of being involved in money mule activity need to come from a source or need to be portrayed in a way which ultimately is going to influence that demographic and that's a that's a difficult difficult one for for banks alone for law enforcement alone and for fraud prevention agencies alone to do how important do you think open data sharing is um, between organisations to make this detection and prevention um, more effective? What could more could there be more collaboration? Can you see more things that could be done um, to help banks, you know, help each other? I have to say, when it comes to money, the issue of money milling, banks collaborate a huge amount when it comes to money mills. Um, not only does it usually take over any other general fraud discussion um, and become the, the, the main topic of conversation, money mules, APP fraud, um, and uh, the contingent reimbursement model are the, are the three main discussion points and have been for a, for a good couple of years. But money mules is absolutely at the forefront. Banks also collaborate around money mules specifically in separate <coughs> separate working groups. And ultimately, the exchange of data and the exchange of um, best practice is the is the first step that needs to happen. And I must say, in respect of money mules, um, banks do that very, very well. Um, the collaboration needs to go further than that. It's not just an interbank collaboration issue. This needs to be a collaboration um, and a sharing of best practice and a sharing of potential solutions and ideas between fraud prevention agencies, between data companies, between service providers and between law enforcement. Um, and it is it is happening. One thing that needs to be remembered, however, when it comes to money mules, is that it isn't an issue which is isolated to um, one mule herder or mule herders generally. It's not an issue which is isolated to banks. It's not a nice issue which is isolated to um, to mules or who are involved in it. Usually, at the core of all of this, there's a victim of fraud. That's who we need to put at the forefront of these discussions and think about: well, how can we make it harder? criminals to take money from those victims 
and ultimately use the UK banking system to launder those, launder those, launder that money. Where do you think is the best um, life cycle point to identify potential money mules? And how do you think firms, the best layers of defense they can have against this type of fraud? You do need a layered approach. So um, it's not just a problem which can be tackled um, at a account opening stage. Um, and equally, um, you can't be negligent to not perform checks at account opening stage and leave it as a transactional based um, model or transactional based tool. Um, you need a, you need to have um, part of your mule strategy, if you like, needs to be within both of those camps. Um, some of the networks which I've investigated when it comes to money mules have seen telltale signs when it comes to changes in contact details, changes in email addresses, and those are some of the opportunities which members can ultimately pick up on um, and predict when money mule activity may happen. Um, it's, it's, it's when an account is, is effectively accessed or used by that third party. It's really interesting. I think the growth in money mules in the UK is almost like a direct, always would have happened, response to the introduction of faster payments and instant payments and the fraudsters starting to follow where the money is rather than having to wait time. Um, can I ask you to kind of to kind of wrap up about a prediction? What do you think is going to happen over the next two years, considering there probably will be some economic um, turmoil to, for us to go through? And how do you think this might affect the psychology of mules that we've been kind of um, discussing? I think money mules is, a, is going to be a long-standing problem and a long-standing issue to tackle because ultimately money laundering has always happened and money muling is a form of money laundering. Unfortunately, um, it's, a, it's a form where a, an individual customer or a typically law-abiding and um, well-intended customer can be, can be involved in it. So it's going to be a, um, a long-standing issue. This needs to be part of your, part of your full-time structure. Um, and bank, banks, are, banks are gearing to set up, set up with that, with that as, a, as an issue, if you like. Um, and from, an, from a structure and organisational point of view, we've started to see, um, started to see banks have money mule teams ultimately, um, which is which is I think where 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 we're we going. You'll also see money mules being dealt with, not just by fraud teams but financial crime teams. One of the one of this one of the topics which you mentioned earlier around um, having known uh, beneficiaries. So banks have become very traditional at having one bank account and having a list of like an address book of known known places where that customer will send money and they do that to prevent the account takeover risk that will happen now almost in reverse 